you know, it, it doesn't just take away your chances here at home, this recession, but it might therefore take away your generation's shot at greatness in the wider world. The generation before you outlawed the idea that the color of your skin decided whether you could vote. It challenged the idea that your sex could decide your future. Well, this generation has the chance to challenge the absurdity of where you live, deciding whether you live. The most vivid example, the most vivid example of this for me was a, a clinic in, uh, in Kigali, in Rwanda in 2003, long queues of two skinny, far too skinny men and women, long queues of, of men and women who are courageous enough to take a HIV test. The nurses knowing that a diagnosis was a death sentence, as there were no antiretroviral drugs in that clinic or any other clinic in Rwanda for that matter. Looking into the eyes of hopelessness, I was surprised to find no anger, no rage. Just a strange acquiescence. Not so the nurses. The nurses who knew that this wasn't a killer disease in Europe or America, they had a very different look in their eyes. Fast forward five years, same clinic, whole different scenario. Nurses beaming with job satisfaction. These Death camps had become birth camps, maternal clinics, what they were supposed to be in the first place. Not just in a city, but a whole country who understood the United States had deep respect for their lives. And this was not the old paternalism, this was partnership. Because without it, partnership that is, without that partnership, Rwanda would not have managed to get life-saving uh, AIDS drugs to 91%, it is, of the people who needed them. Good leadership, as it happens. We have problems in Rwanda with the leadership there on other fronts, but on this, they got the AIDS drugs to the people provided by the United States. It's a moving story. And we are moved by such moving events. I'm probably here because of such events. But I tell you this, in the one campaign, ours is not a soft focal lens. We try to keep our ardor cold. Welcome the evidence-based activists. Can you believe that, the dryness of that term? I'm proud of the dryness of it. <laughs> evidence-based activists, yours truly. <laughs> and I'm here to tell you that your heart is not the most important thing. It helps. But your heart is not going to solve these problems. If your heart hasn't found a rhyme with your head, we're not going to get anywhere. It's not charity that fires us at the one campaign or at red. It's justice. That's what inflames us. And justice is a higher, tougher standard. This is hard work. I'm not going to soft pedal it. We've meetings sometimes about marketing. Marketing. People are looking for clear, simple melody lines, you know? Just a dollar and you can save a life. Just a minute of your time, just an hour of your week. It's bollocks. It's not true, it's crap. In truth, if you want to turn the world right side up, it's not gonna take a minute or an hour or a day. It's gonna take your whole life. And I'm gonna make a bid for that this evening to you. So that was the brakes. Now for the gas. <laughs> And for me, where it all started. Um, it all starts where humanity started. And where our humanity is needed now, it's Africa. I mean, you should ask a very good question. Why would you be listening to me talking about Africa? Um, Desmond Tutu is much funnier. Um, but he's much busier. <laughs> but I'm, you know, this Africa is been an extraordinary adventure for me and privilege. Africa, wild, magnificent, magical, sometimes maddening Africa, but it is extraordinary. I realized the other day that I have been working for Nelson Mandela and Archbishop Desmond Tutu for most of my life. 
um, I think since I was 18, from anti-apartheid to uh, through drop the debt, from the fight against hunger to the fight for human rights, human rights, right to live like a human. Nelson Mandela and Archbishop Tutu, there's no point in even trying to turn them down, by the way. <laughs> Particularly Tutu, because he calls in the big guns. On the rare occasion that I have tried to turn him down, he has told me that he will personally see to it that I won't get into heaven. <laughs> uh, and I think he might have that kind of pull. <laughs> but even if it weren't, um, for them, I think I'd have felt the pull to Africa because Ireland, maybe, got some Irish friends there, Brent and Andrea, maybe Irish ambassador there, very cool. <laughs> Ireland has a very living memory of famine um, and coming out from under colonialization or maybe it's just because Africa's the future and Edge is from the future. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, well, you know, we're all interested in the future and, you know, what the world will look like, you know, for the kids. People say China is the future. But if you ask the Chinese, they're all headed to Africa. The largest diaspora of recent times is from China to Africa. By 2050, Africa's population is going to be twice the size of China's. Africa's going to be big and it's going to be young. 60% of Africans right now are under 25. Can you imagine that? All across the continent, people are writing new rules for the game, African entrepreneurs, African civil society, a whole new generation of politicians. They're the catalysts of change, and you, you can see the impact in so many ways. For example, 14 of the poorest countries, which didn't benefit from the last decade's commodity boom, but did get 100% debt cancellation and a threefold increase in aid, achieved the following. Extreme poverty on track to be halved by 2015. Child mortality nearly halved already. School enrollment doubled. And economic growth 5.5% on average for a decade. You want data? I got data. <laughs> <clears throat> we used to talk about Asian tigers. And actually for a minute we were talking about a Celtic one. Um, <laughs> It was nice, um, well, it lasted. But this is not an African tiger, this is a lion. This is a pride of lions. And lots of them are roaring. Some of them are not. Some of them are in a bad mood, injured, licking their wounds. And we all know a wounded lion is a dangerous thing. Take Mali, ethnomusicologists trace the origin of the blues and therefore rock and roll to Mali in West Africa. And I was just there in January at the renowned music festival in the desert, Festival de la Desert, uh, in the dunes outside of Timbuktu. And uh, it's amazing, by the way, really awesome. Um, a month after we left Al-Qaeda, known regionally as Ansar Dine, they took over the whole north of Mali the north of Mali is about the size of France. And now the hotel that we stayed in, small little hotel, is a Sharia tribunal. And music is now against the law. I mean, they put you into prison for playing music. You get beaten for playing the blues. You get beaten to death on occasion for playing the blues. And Mali is a, is a case study for the whole of that vast belt of, of, of sand and savanna, uh, it called the Sahel, which includes Sudan and, and Somalia and, and Nigeria, which is an enormous country. Um, and in this geography, we get to see up close what we call the three extremes. Um, it's an unholy trio of extreme poverty, extreme climate, and extreme ideology. Very dangerous, unholy trio. Um, stronger than any chain and, and harder to break. So some <clears throat> of Africa is rising and some of Africa is stuck. The question is whether the rising bit will pull the rest of Africa up or whether the other Africa 
will weigh the continent down. Which will it be? Stakes here aren't just about them. Uh, imagine for a second this last global recession, but without the economic growth of China and India, without the hundreds of millions of newly minted middle class folks who now buy American and European goods. Imagine that. Think about the last five years. Rockstar preaches capitalism. <laughs> wow. Sometimes I hear myself and I just can't believe it. Um, but commerce is real. That's what you're about here. It's real. Aid is just a stopgap. Commerce, entrepreneurial capitalism, takes more people out of poverty than aid. Of course we know that. We need Africa to become an economic powerhouse. It's not just in their interest, it's in ours. It's in our national, in national security interest too, your national security interest in particular. Um, we want to see the, the region uh, fulfill its, its potential. So, so cure the, uh, cue up the, the, the drum roll. Um, you can if you like. Um, Enter our protagonist. Enter the most powerful force for change on the continent. Enter the strongest, loudest, clearest voice for progress. Enter the nerd. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I did say the nerd. I did say the nerd because it is the nerds, the innovators, the programmers who are changing the game, not only here in America, but even more in places like Africa, which are more mobile than we are. Africa is the second largest mobile market uh, after Asia. This is the era of the Afro nerd. <laughs> and what are these Afro nerds up to? You know what they're up to? They're upending the pyramid. You know about social media and the role it played in the Arab Spring. I recently met Whale Gonin. Gonin. I'm sure you know him. He worked in Google, and he set up one of the Facebook groups behind the Tahrir Square thing, got thrown in jail for it. And uh, I was at the Founders Conference in Dublin, and he was explaining the role of technology and how it has narrowed the gap between the power of the politicians and the power of individuals. You see, according to Whale, technology has turbocharged social movements. And this is this element I'm telling you about that defines your generation. And it works on lots of surfaces. For example, it is definitely true that the biggest killer of them all, bigger than malaria, bigger than AIDS, bigger than TB, probably bigger than all three combined, the disease that kills the most people in the world, and the world's poor, is corruption. But we have the vaccine. We have the vaccine. It's called transparency. It's called daylight, sunlight, information. Technology is increasing transparency, you see? Now, there might be some downsides to this, like the fact that I'm on my holidays with my kids and my wife, and a picture of my sunburned arse turns up on the cover of a tabloid. <laughs> That is true. I think bottoms up was the headline. 